Hello, looking YouTubers, Autumn with SpongeBob 101 back here again on the SpongeBob channel with more SpongeBob news. Today is May 5th, 2024, and we've got a follow up to our previous news video that we had celebrating SpongeBob's 25th anniversary. So, the first order of business Sandy Cheeks movie now has a release date. So, before I even get into the article, the answer is August 2nd, 2024. Okay, so now that that is out of the way, here we are on Netflix's official news site here. First look, Sandy Cheeks is saving Bikini Bottom in an all-new movie. The squirrely star of SpongeBob SquarePants slides into the spotlight. So uh, let's take a look at what they have to say here. Yeehaw! More than 25 years after she was introduced in the first episode of SpongeBob, Sandy is getting her own movie, and the stakes couldn't be higher. The plucky maritime rodent is off on a quest with SpongeBob to save her adopted hometown. Bikini Bottom will never be the same. You can read on to find out about or find out more about everyone's favorite Texan squirrel and her upcoming adventure. Giddy up. Okay, so basically here they give you a very short description of the plot and who's in the cast. Well, of course, uh, typical SpongeBob voice actors as usual, as well as a couple more. And when will Saving Bikini Bottom, the Sandy Cheeks movie, be on Netflix? Now, again, it's a Netflix exclusive, so you got to sign up for Netflix. But, I mean, you know, the movie already kind of leaked. So I'm pretty sure you guys have your opinions on it. Uh, most of you probably already watched it. But if you haven't and are specifically waiting for the official release date, Saving Bikini Bottom dies onto Netflix on August 2nd, 2024. As Sandy would say, it'll be here faster than a barefoot jackrabbit on a hot, greasy griddle in the middle of August. Yeah, that was a doozy. Okay, before we move on to the next point, I just wanted to show you guys the current state of the IMDb page for the Sandy Cheeks movie. It does, of course, show the new release date of August 2nd, 2024. But one thing I'm um, not too surprised about, but still a little bit surprised for some reason, 4.7 out of 10 IMDb rating. Now, of course, this is a community rating, not a critique-based uh, rating, right? So, or... Well, you don't have movie critics putting in their ratings just um, yet. However, these ratings are presumably based on the fact that the movie leaked and everyone kind of watched it, or at least whoever wanted to watch it has watched it. Uh, I'll save my review for it once the movie does come out in August. But uh, 4.7 out of 10 doesn't look very good with 110 votes. I'm sure once the movie releases, uh, they'll pull up the score a little bit. Or, I mean, really depends on, on the actual reception of the movie once it is released officially on Netflix. And that will be interesting to see. Because I don't think it's really as so bad that it deserves a 4.7 out of 10. But I don't think the movie was amazing either. So, yeah, if you want to hear my take on it, well, you'll get that video in August. Okay, so that's the Sandy Cheeks movie. Let's move on to the second order of business here. New SpongeBob episodes, or more specifically, new Patrick Star Show episodes in May 2024. So we've just gotten the um, premiere dates for four new 11-minute episodes, starting off with 35B of Season 2, of course. Tattoo Hullabaloo premieres May 20th, 2024. Bunny loses a tattoo. Uh, doesn't sound very exciting there. For some reason, we are skipping 36A, too many Patricks, and moving directly to 36B. Much tofu about nothing. May 21st, 2024, Pathos shares a Hamdonian tale of love and pork products. 37A, face off slash model. May 22nd, 2024, Patrick wakes up off model. And lastly, 37B, Five-star restaurant, May 23rd, 2024. The Star family works at the Krusty Krab. So based on these synopsis, for me at least, I would say five-star restaurant sounds the most interesting and uh, gives me, like, the... Well, I have the highest expectations for five-star restaurant. And for the other three, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to have to watch it and see. So, yeah, let me know if you guys are excited for these. And uh, if I do have the time, I'll make episode reviews, but... Uh, in case you didn't realize already, I haven't done episode reviews for quite a long while because they just take a lot of time. And, you know, since I'm working now, I, I just don't have that extra time, unfortunately. Okay, 
So now the third order of business and pseudo final one, we are here on the Emmys website, the Television Academy, because I wanted to give you guys a look here. SpongeBob at 25, the origins of Nickelodeon's animated hit, exclusive. Now, you might be thinking, oh, wait, didn't we already do this on um, Wednesday with the uh, 25th anniversary special? Not really, because that NPR um, article was talking about generally how SpongeBob has progressed. Uh, here we have an interview with the co-creator, or at least that's what they're calling him, uh, Tim Hill, on the legacy of Bikini Bottom's most famous resident. So we're going to dive right in here to the questions because these uh, are kind of interesting. What do you think stands out about SpongeBob? Why have this character and why has this show had such longevity? So Hill says the character, for one, is a short from cartoon, 11 minutes long and the stories move pretty fast. It's really entertaining and it doesn't really slow down. Good point. In fact, sometimes it's a little bit too fast because, you know, the episode sometimes ends, at least for me, abruptly. And in, in certain cases, I really do feel like a longer episode would have been greater because that story just felt like it could be stretched out more. Then there's the innovation of a show taking place underwater, which in and of itself has rules. But then we break all those rules by portraying surface live under the sea, like, you know, having fire underwater. There's really good transposition that I think always worked. Cars that are shaped like boats, very nautical themes, a seafood restaurant where they're all fish. It's funny. And we always play with contrasts that didn't make sense. And it shouldn't have worked. But it totally did. So we always thought that the stupider it is, the funnier. We were making that show for us. And we didn't pander to kids. We just made something we thought was funny and it translated. Um, I would argue slightly with this statement because sometimes it did feel like SpongeBob was really too childish uh, and dumb at the same time. So uh, there are certain situations where I, I feel like it did kind of pander to kids, but in no way is SpongeBob like a... Uh, you know, Blue's Clues or Dora the Explorer or anything like that. It's still aimed at, you know, older kids at least. And of course, for the nostalgia crowd, of which I am Millie am part of, uh, the, did you have any sense that you were making something that would grow to become what it is? Here's the thing. So Steve was a showrunner on Rocco's and Tim Hill was a story editor. So the deal had gave him a chance to develop his own show, so he came out with all these funny drawings of sea creatures including a sponge and a starfish. Uh, again, talking about the inner tidal zone, but we were able to combine all these ideas with his fantastic sketches. And there's a book that has them, again, the inner tidal zone, so he needed help writing, and we did a barter where he drew for me some images or a pitch deck that I was trying to get going. In that process, we were just making ourselves laugh, and nobody knows anything, so we were hopeful the network would pick it up. We weren't trying to hit certain marks for the network or anything like that. And I don't know if the network really knew what to do with it because it was pretty out there. They had a pretty good following as a network and could afford to take some risks, but I'm glad they did. And we had no idea what it was going to be. Okay, so, you know, really like anything here, starting a business or, or whatnot, you're taking risks and you really don't know what's going to happen. You can't predict some thing you know being successful right so of course this is a obvious answer to a certain extent not to take credit away from them it's just yeah kind of i mean they probably wouldn't have known anyway what about the cottage industry that it became the merchandising alone has reportedly earned 13 billion in revenue yeah i'm not surprised i think that's basically the uh, main answer here so for newbies like me and steve they could say you want to make your thing but you got to sign this I mean, I'm not bitter about it. I was just having fun and didn't really care. I don't see myself as a co-creator. I helped Steve develop the show. I worked on the pilot, developed premises for a series, and I worked on the series Bible, which was really good. It was me, director and storyboard artist Derek Dryman, and Steve coming up with it. It was great to work with Steve. We laughed so hard. It was just a great time. And you can really see the passion that... Uh, Tim Hill, you know, Stephen Hillenberg and all of, the, all of them, they have passion for this show. And, you know, that's just one, but a very important part of why the show is successful. Do you think about the legacy of the show? There are now several generations that have grown up on it. Yeah, I do. I'm old enough to know millennials or Gen Zs who grew up watching it and who really loved it. They always ask me about certain episodes and either I don't remember or when they spit it back to me, I oh, I go, 
Oh yeah, that was really funny, and I hear from relatives who love to watch the show with the kids. That was a big advantage of SpongeBob. You didn't just park the kids in front of the TV to watch some cartoon because adults could enjoy it as well. So that's part of the legacy. You could still watch it at any age and get a laugh out of it or appreciate it. And this last line is true because I'm no longer a kid. I'm no longer a teenager. I'm now an adult, <laughs> and I'm still a SpongeBob fan. I'm sure there are many of you who are kind of in a, in a similar position here.、Um, Whether it's a nostalgia or the fact that you do appreciate it, like I do, because of the the silly humor、uh, that does take a little bit off my mind, you know, when I'm stressed about work or previously when I was stressed about school,、uh, it, it really helped,、uh, and I really appreciate SpongeBob and everyone who was behind the show for that. So yeah, that is the interview with Tim Hill. Now, finally, I want to end off here with this、uh, presumably 25th anniversary logo. Uh, we've seen a sneak peek of this、uh, that I featured in the previous video, and it looks like we do have the、um, new completed version. I really like the silhouette design of it, and the twenty-five of all the characters in the background, all sorts of different things: the Krabby Patty, coral, flowers, pineapple, seaweed. Yeah, it's a really nice one, and I look forward to seeing this on other promotional material as the year progresses. Okay, so one more thing. Or two more things. Number one, if you guys were wondering where the SpongeBob Adventures in a Gem content is, don't worry, it's coming. I promise. That's one. And number two,、uh, following up on what I discussed in my previous video, I will be heading to the United States and Canada this July, July twenty twenty four. So if you guys、uh, want me to do anything SpongeBob related, like go to any stores to hunt for SpongeBob stuff. Let me know in the comments.、Uh, I'll be doing a community post on this as well. So I just want to get you guys in, you know,、uh, suggestions just in case I miss anything out on my own when I'm doing my own research on it. But of course,、uh, we will be heading to Nickelodeon Universe in American Dream Mall in New Jersey. So that's definitely one thing that I'm going to be doing. But、um, yeah, I look forward to hearing your suggestions in the comments. Make sure to subscribe, like, and I'll see you guys again in the next video coming real soon. Till then, bye.